Hi everyone, this is Peter. Um, I'm going to try to put together a series of short video lectures um, that have to do with the problem of looking at works of art. Um, this is pretty much a more general uh, emphasis than some of the videos that I make uh, for my students and whoever might be interested in the general public. Um, I'm just going to title them How to Look at a Work of Art. It's a little bit of a throwback uh, to a famous book, which I actually have never read, but that was popular uh, mid 20th century, so called How or So, uh, called How to Read a Book. Um, and I, it, the title is misleading from the get go, I suppose, because it's not just about looking, it's how to think about a, a work of art. But we'll start with How to Look uh, at a Work of Art for the working title. Um, and I'm going to focus on just using as a platform a somewhat arbitrary choice, but um, I think it's not entirely uh, the worst one to pick. It's a, it's a painting from the, um, from the 15th century, um, roughly around 1440 or so, uh, from the city of Florence uh, by an artist that's uh, known, uh, a sort of shorthand known, Fra Angelico. Uh, Fra Angelico is an interesting character uh, in a lot of ways, a very, very important transitional figure in the 15th century. And his art um, sits in, an, again, an interesting place in terms of the development of naturalism in uh, Western Europe in the 15th century. So you can kind of think of this if you wanted to, probably too much in-depth uh, discussion of that particular artist. Um, you could think of it for anyone who's interested in Italian Renaissance art, which I have been for a long time, a kind of very deep dive into um, into this particular painting and the sort of circumstances in which it arose. There are lots of ways to think about it, but just for right now, I'm just going to kind of focus on this particular um, this particular piece of art and and this particular artist. Um, and I'm just going to go through a kind of set of different questions associated with works of art. This is not going to be exhaustive. It's not necessarily going to be methodical or analytical. I just want to point out some issues uh, for people, again, uh, general uh, museum goers or uh, students, introductory students in art history or art appreciation, people who are interested in the problems uh, of analyzing visual representation uh, in general. So it's not intended to be particularly academic. I'm not going to provide specific uh, references. Uh, I think that there's plenty of material, plenty of literature out this. Um, classic example would be John Berger's um, Ways of Seeing as a, a sort of real classic from the 20th century. Um, I do think that it's important for the arts in general to be taken quite a bit more seriously than they are at present. Um, and one of the sort of most important steps uh, for promoting that uh, understanding of the importance of the, of the visual is, is, you know, productions, even if only, you know, 15 people watch this video. So I'm going to start uh, from the perspective, so to speak, that's an unintended pun there, uh, what is it? So I'm just going to take a few minutes and uh, look uh, at this particular piece of art. So let's find the next next slide. As they used to say, slides don't really exist, at least beyond a uh, kind of metaphorical sense. So this is the piece that, that I'm going to look at. And it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty large, um, pretty large fresco. Let me just bump ahead a little bit and we'll come back to this piece in a sec. You can see uh, on the right, a couple of renditions of the subject, and we'll talk more about the subject, maybe just in passing in this lecture, but certainly later lectures, and like what's it about and, and so forth. You can see it's a rather large um, a wall painting, what, what art historians would describe as a mural painting. That's to say, um, part of the wall, I think is a good way of uh, thinking about it. So part of the wall. And so when we talk about what is it, that's going to be uh, really important uh, aspect. Um, the title of uh, the piece, and we'll just go back to the main view here, uh, 
is the subject uh, from the story, basically the life of Christ, the Annunciation. And the Annunciation as a subject matter, again, I don't want to go too deeply into that. We'll save that for another time, um, is particularly critical in the Christian story. Uh, hence the prominent uh, size um, and, and indeed position it's in its uh, in situ location. In situ, I-N space S-I-T-U, means that the, the work of art is in the place it was intended to be originally. So it's not in a museum or it's not somebody's house unless it was actually intended to be part of that museum or intended to be in that house to begin with. Okay, so again, just to give a couple basic markers, um, uh, painted by an individual known today as Fra Angelico, Fra Giovanni of Fidesole. Um, there's, uh, that's another interesting story, which we don't have time to go into in this one, but I might talk about it later, you know, who made it and that kind of subject, a lot of questions. <laughs> Um, and uh, part of a series of, and now we'll get into what is it, um, of frescoes painted in uh, the artist's uh, own monastery in Florence, still uh, around today. And it's a very famous museum in Florence, the monastery of uh, San Marco. So sometime around 1440. So what is it um, is a critical piece to consider in studying art history. One of the fascinating aspects of art history is the fact that in many instances, not all, it's much more complicated than that, so I don't want to be reducing art to what it's not, um, but in many cases, you are looking at things. Um, so take an example of what I mean. If you studied English literature, you typically would not, unless you're very specialized, be talking about the physical culture of books. That is to say, you know, types of paper or ink or um, typeface and things like that. So in art, we talk about that all the time. So the physical circumstances of manufacture are a critical part of an understanding of a work of art in a way that in other sort of humanities disciplines, uh, that's typically, uh, that emphasis is typically absent. So for us to get a better understanding of what's happening, uh, with the scene of the Annunciation. And again, as, as I said in another talk, I'll go into more detail about uh, what the subject matter is and what that might mean. Um, the emphasis in this uh, in this study of the Annunciation by Frangelico is going to talk a little bit about its material culture. So let me just go uh, forward again to that scene. Uh, this uh, picked up off the web. Um, showing a view of uh, the fresco as it is part of the wall that's at the top uh, of, a, of a set of stairs that leads to the monk's cells in uh, the monastery of San, of San Marco. So you can see, and, and by way of comparison, by the way, the much smaller uh, annunciation within an actual uh, cell right here, and you get a sense of the way, and this is a, a thing that to think about in terms of the what is it question, the way in which a work of art is embedded within a setting can really provide a lot of its meaning. Um, and, and this is, for instance, is quite specifically alluded to in the piece of art itself. Um, to show you what I mean, let me just go back again. We can see um, in the scene itself, Right, a great deal of emphasis on architecture um, and the, the Virgin Mary in a very sort of humble position on this stool, uh, being greeted by the, um, uh, the angel Gabriel, who's about to announce that she's going to uh, eventually give birth uh, to Jesus. So what's fascinating about this in terms of its setting is that there is a kind of inscription that directly alludes to that. Um, and, and we can just zoom in a little bit on that pretty easily. And um, and right about here, let's go in a little bit closer. There is an inscription in Latin. An inscription in Latin. I'm not going to read out the Latin uh, word, genus, syntacte, etc. Um, the monks uh, in that monastery would, would have been uh, literate in Latin and uh, would have understood this. And they were expected to read it. And they were expected 
uh, it's, a, it's a kind of imperative command. Um, in essence, saying, uh, when you look, when you are, uh, uh, how does it, how's the term, uh, the, the um, translation, as you venerate, there are a number of different translations, I think this one's good, as you venerate while passing before it, this figure of the intact version, a virgin, <laughs> beware lest you omit to say a Hail Mary. Um, so what's going on? This, by the way, the beware, kawe, right? So that's the, the Latin, beware. And make sure that you say an Ave, an Ave Maria. So what's going on here is kind of fascinating in terms of a what is it question, because in essence, what's going on is the location and function and situation of the work of art is embedded in that very description. Okay, and you get this kind of interesting echo, let me just pull down a little bit, where the monks are kind of interacting with these two figures, that intersection of art and viewer, worshiper and figure to be worshiped is, is kind of embedded in the, the very fabric of the building itself and the and that um you know that statement that uh you know piece of directions uh, in essence is sort of guide to how to interact is is given right there and that's you know that's to be honest not typical in a lot of works of art it's kind of guide hey if you're a monk in the monastery of san marco you're going by this wall that's part of the fabric of the building where you in essence are spending your life remember to say and an, uh, an ave maria um it's worth pointing out that that text aspect is um echoed in the words of um, uh, the angel, where, where he basically says, um, you know, addresses the Virgin Mary um, and, and gives gives the uh, um, gives the good news, as it were. And that's the, that's in the script here. It's kind of interesting distinction between one announcement and another announcement, if you will. Um, so, what is it? Let's get back uh, one more time to the. Uh, um to the uh the view of it in the monastery so what does that mean let's let's uh just look here real quick um second so what does it mean uh to talk about fresco so what is fresco fresco in essence is painting embedded in the wall in a plaster wall the wall of the building so what would happen with this, the process, and, and this could be looked up in any number of places, but I'll just give you a quick sort of summary of it, is in essence, a brick wall is going to be given a coat of plaster, a relatively rough one, sometimes with a study, a, a sort of preparatory study uh, in a kind of red uh, chalk. This is known as synopia, sort of under underdrawing. And then there is a very thin layer of plaster put over that, which is painted over in watercolor. And fresco tends to lend itself to relatively bold and vigorous uh, creation of form. You have to also have to work quickly because the plaster is drying while you're painting on it. Um, and art historians who look at big, bigger productions, like for instance, this scene right here, can actually look at the individual pieces of plaster that might be set up. Uh, for instance, who knows uh, how this is organized? I don't know personally, but sections like the Virgin Mary's robe right here, or uh, the head of the angel, these kinds of things uh, would be in, done in separate sections and then uh, allowed to dry. And then artists can trace this because each later section overlaps the previous one in terms of plaster applied to it. So what is it? In this particular case, there's a lot going on in terms of analyzing what it is. And, and I've sort of snuck in another thing, which we might tackle in more detail later, uh, where it is, but what it is and where it is, in essence, impinge upon each other. And I mentioned that, and I might come back to these images later, but if we look at other enunciations by the same artist on the left, an enunciation on a panel in Cortona, and on the right on another panel in, um, in the Prado in Spain, that question of embeddedness in a particular place or life of a group of individuals is relatively absent in terms of our own understanding of it. 